My name is Dr. Frank Sherba. I direct the Emphysema COPD Research Center here at UPMC, and I'm here to talk about my recent uh, pulmonary grand rounds, which covered the topics of selected topics in COPD, including bronchoscopic volume reduction approaches and recent uh, attention to hospital readmission policies on COPD. So lung volume reduction uh, was initially reintroduced back in the early 90s uh, to uh, remove the most destroyed areas of lung in patients with advanced emphysema, allowing the more uh, relatively preserved lung to expand into that space to function better. And it was shown that it could uh, result in dramatic improvements in quality of life, exercise tolerance, and lung function in selected individuals. The problem is that there was significant morbidity associated with it. Patients had prolonged pneumothoraces, um, often required prolonged ventilation in about 20% of the patients. And uh, even though eventually it was shown to be effective and approved for uh, use by um, CMS, uh, it hasn't really been used that frequently because of the uh, concern about the adverse effects. As a result, there have been many uh, innovative uh, companies that have produced less invasive bronchoscopic approaches in an attempt to elicit the same effects as the surgical approaches with less morbidity. Among those approaches were valvular approaches, which we were instrumental here at UPMC in studying uh, earlier uh, this decade, um, and we'll discuss that a bit. Um, recently, bronchoscopic coils, uh, which uh, pull in and uh, uh, compress lung to allow expansion of other tissue. And there have been other approaches that have uh, uh, not evolved as quickly, including uh, a steam approach and, and other um, fibrosing uh, uh, sealants that uh, have ultimately, um, because of adverse events, been uh, slow to uh, proceed. So uh, the one version of the endobronchial valves, which was originally by the uh, Emphasis Company and now by uh, Pulmonics, um, were uh, studied in the pivotal VENT trial, which was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, UPMC uh, played a big role in, in that trial. Uh, it in fact did show that there were selected patients that had a fairly good response to these valves. Unfortunately, across the full spectrum of patients studied, uh, the results were not dramatic. Uh, we learned from that trial that patients have to have very heterogeneous emphysema, where certain areas of the lung are much more destroyed than other areas. So if you put the valves in and compress those more affected areas, that better quality lung can fill. The other problem uh, with the valves that we learned in that trial is that some patients have collaterals, incomplete fissures separating the two uh, major lobes in the lung. And if patients have these collaterals, we're not able to get effective um, collapse of the uh, intervened uh, lobe. And therefore, we have to pay attention to do this procedure in patients who do not have significant collateral flow between the two lobes. So th these were really the, the main issues. And now moving forward, there's an, a new trial ongoing to study these valves called the LIBERATE trial. And in this trial, we will pay special attention to taking patients who are more heterogeneous, at least a 15% difference between the amount of emphysema in the upper and lower lung zones. Um, we will be using a new device called the CHARTIST device, which will assess collateral flow between the lobes and take patients who only have minimal collateral flow. Um, and in addition, one other problem with the VENT trial was that we learned that after attempted placement, these valves weren't really always remaining in the right place, and therefore they weren't doing their job. With the LIBERATE trial, we will assess by CT scan some time after the procedure, and if the valves are not in the right place, we are allowed to reposition those valves to uh, elicit the effect of therapy. Uh, the other component in the LIBERATE trial is because there is a risk of pneumothorax with these valve trials, perhaps up to 20%, 
we're going to follow these patients after the procedure for about four days, which is the period where uh, pneumothorax or collapsed lung is most likely to occur. Um, and uh, so they'll, these patients will have a safety period before they're, they're sent home. Um, it's probably over uh, aggressive, but uh, I think uh, erring on the side of safety, I, I think it will make it a safer procedure. Interestingly, the patients that do get the pneumothorax, because of the tension forces on the lung, often get the best response downstream once you get it through that. And when you compare this to lung volume reduction surgery, uh, where almost everybody gets a prolonged air leak, uh, it's really a small price to pay for the uh, potential effects. So we at UPMC um, were the top U.S. enroller in the recent Renew uh, endobronchial valve trial. Um, the company uh, Numerex sponsored uh, this trial, and this is a very innovative device that is basically a, a 10 to 15 centimeter long uh, nitinol uh, metal rod that goes in directly and then it coils up. Um, it's placed in the areas of the greatest emphysema and again eliciting the effects that we hope for, allowing re-expansion of better quality lung, increasing the tension to support flow through the airways that are affected by uh, the severe emphysema. The advantages of the uh, endobronchial coils compared to the valves is it appears to uh, have some level of efficacy in patients with more homogeneous disease, uh, so it doesn't require patients, uh, we believe, who are, who are as heterogeneous, and is also effective even in the presence of significant collateral flow. Therefore, this device uh, um, may be effective in situations where the valves are, are not likely to uh, be effective. In other words, patients with more homogeneous disease as well as uh, 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 collateral flow between the lobes. Um, it also, however, does work in heterogeneous disease. And so ultimately, where the valves may have a role and be most effective and where the coils may be most effective will ultimately uh, uh, pan out with these ongoing pivotal trials. Um, my hope is that, in fact, we'll have a tool chest of at least these two, if not other approaches available uh, to customize the uh, intervention to the specific aspects of the individual patients. So there's been a recent increased attention to the readmission rate uh, due to CO in COPD patients who are discharged from the hospital. Across the country, there's about a 21% readmission rate for patients with COPD who are discharged. So as part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, there is uh, attention to these readmissions to reduce costs of care, and uh, there's going to be fines on hospitals who do not address it and reduce this readmission rate. COPD, uh, because it is a uh, significant cost uh, burden for uh, Medicare, is in fact one of those diseases that there's now great attention to this issue. Um, there's, of course, great debate as to whether this is a problem or a solvable problem. Uh, some would argue that if you decrease readmission rate, that this may be associated with a higher mortality rate because you're not bringing back patients uh, that really need to come into the hospital. And the other aspect is some would argue that these readmissions are not easily avoidable uh, in patients with COPD, unlike with other diseases, and that they're not a consequence of bad health care but just intrinsic to the nature of disease. Despite this, uh, I think it has been effective in getting hospitals really to look over their policies regarding the care of COPD patients and attention to issues that could be possibly related to readmission to affect it to whatever extent we're capable of doing. Um, one of the aspects is just creating pathways to uh, increase the standard of care across the board, not only for specialists, but for primary care physicians who may be less experienced in, in uh, nuances of managing COPD or who may be overworked managing many, many different diseases to provide the state-of-the-art standard of care within that hospital system. Uh, there's a need for greater attention to that transition when patients are discharged from the hospital and thrown back into their homes 
and there's so many things that can go wrong at that time and to make sure everything is covered including they have their oxygen set up for them when they get home they know what medications they're supposed to be on and how that is related to what they used to be on it can be very confusing there needs to be uh, attention to monitoring those patients. In some cases, the more severe patients may need in-home care and in-home monitoring. Um, there has to be really uh, responsiveness and, and following of these patients' trajectory. If they're doing worse, the system needs to intervene immediately and not wait because this could be a critical period to prevent a decline that would ultimately result in readmissions. And then one other aspect that is often a difficult topic is to realize when care becomes futile and that these readmissions now serve no purpose and to discuss and educate on the timing of palliative care issues and hospice care, uh, which is necessary in some of our patients. And in fact, uh, when patients who are chosen appropriately in this period of their lives understand this and move in this direction actually there's much greater satisfaction by those patients and their family and, and actually decreases the readmission rate as a downstream effect. Mm -hmm.